Howdy folks, Justin here, and we, it's, I mean, it's not patch day, but we got a bunch of, a, notif a bunch of notifications for a bunch of uh, balance changes that are going to be going into effect next week uh, to give people enough time to prepare for the QuakeCon Masters Series Grand Finale, which will be uh, on like the, sometime between the 7th and the 11th, because that's when I'm going to be at QuakeCon. Um, and these these patches are some a lot of stuff we've been talking about for a very long time. Let's dive right in. I, I have some thoughts about all of these, and uh, yeah, let's start with the first and the big one: drain vitality. Uh, it used to be that level three drain vitality gave all enemy creatures minus two, minus two. That's everything on the board. Now level three drain vitality will give all enemy creatures in a single lane minus two, minus two. Um, it's tough, right? And I know. They're kind of like two camps. There are people who advocated for this, and there are people who advocated to make Daring Vitality cost more. I, I never really felt very strongly about either side. When I made any recommendations uh, when I was at Maryland, in Maryland myself, um, I, I encouraged it to cost more uh, because it just seemed too effectively costed. Um, but I kinda, I, what I like about this change is that this this does mean that there's going to be a lot more counterplay play. It, it, it makes it a, a more challenging card for both players. And I like that kind of complexity. I like games being, you know, coming down to who makes the right decision at the right moment. Obviously, Old Drain Vitality was kind of just like, oh, fire this off, like, when you can. And, yeah. Look, this is still going to be one of those powerful cards in the game. I just think that it now rewards players uh, based on how well they're playing around it and how well they're playing with it. It's not nearly as powerful. It's been significantly decreased in power level, but it is still very good and it'll still see play and the decks that it's in are still good decks. It's just been brought down. And I think that's a theme you kind of see throughout most of these, these changes, right? None of these are like debilitating changes, right? This is not like when Supreme Atromancer went to 10 and suddenly you're like, well, that's actually just enough to make this card unplayable for me in the mid-range decks that I was using to, using it as a finisher in. Although, I think that card, is Supreme Atromancer, is still a lot better than the zero play it sees would suggest. I'm very supportive of this change. It remains to be seen what the larger impact will be of this, you know, because... Halalu, for instance, and, and the latter experience is more what I'm talking about, not so much the tournament experience, which I think is actually going to be more dramatically impacted by this change. The latter experience sort of is that your level two drain, your, your level three drain vitality was your answer as a lot of decks to Halalu, which and uh, Agro Crusader, both of which are pretty popular on the latter. This makes this not really you know a great answer anymore. I think that Telvani control decks are going to be less impacted because they still have access to Ice Storm and Firestorm reverberating strike all the blue damage based mass removal options whereas con you know control scout uprising scout is going to be most significantly hurt by this on the ladder that said i think that uprising scout is a stronger deck on the ladder than uprising telvani is so you know i think that the idea is that some decks were just significantly stronger than others and they're being brought down to a similar power level to things that weren't affected by nerfs decks for instance that exploit ash berserker um, Ash Berserker not hit one of the most powerful cards in the game, and I think that this just brings these power these cards down to a level that is similar to other very powerful cards. So, I, I'm 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 a fan fan of this change. I don't expect it to change a whole lot about deck building or anything like that. It's not like you're, you're thinking I'm going to run something else. Drain Vitality is pretty unique in what it does, and I uh, expect that it will remain the king of what it does. Next up, we have Ulfric's Uprising. Ulfric's Uprising is a card that I have personally been very afraid of for quite a while. I think this card is dangerous, right? Like, very dangerous. Because it it affects the power level of every summon ability you can print on a creature while it exists. I just, I, I firmly believe that. I've recommended this card for Nurse before. In fact, I recommended it for Utter Deletion, uh, kind of tongue-in-cheekly, you know. Ulfric's Uprising is fun in the sense that, like, it does encourage you to build all sorts of decks that otherwise wouldn't work without it. Uprising Scout is just not a functional deck without this. It's just Ramp Scout. It's probably the next best thing you can build there, and it's just nowhere near as powerful as the Uprising version. I think that Ramp uh, Uprising Scout actually is going to be unaffected by this. Uprising Telvani is going to be more challenging mathematically. 
<laughs> like that you need a TI-86 just to like get started playing Nick Sox combo uprising Tolvani. Uh I hope that's a reference that kids get. Um but at this point between the Nick Sox nerf and this nerf, the math is getting a lot more crunched. Um, but I still think it's a good card. And I kind of like that this is being hit now, too, because, you know, as much as people have been complaining, myself included at times, about how stale the meta feels, people at the very top end, people like, I'm thinking about Turquoise Link and his uh, Uprising Tribunal list that he brought and did very well with at the qualifying, the Masters Qualifier last weekend. This is a card that really was just beginning to see play on the level that I think it actually deserves. Uh, Scout was just sort of taking everyone's attention. Tavani was taking everyone's attention. But there's a lot more degenerate stuff you can do with this card. And you'll continue to be able to do in the future. And the, the thing is, is that I don't think that the cost of it is significantly going to impact these decks, which are already running ramp cards. It just makes it a little worse. The power level is still there. This is still an incredibly powerful card. It's just a little worse. And I expect it to continue to see play. I would be shocked, if, actually, if we don't see an Ulfric's Uprising deck uh, it, you know, being played successfully at the grand finale uh, of the Masters Series tournament. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy with this change. I, I'm very concerned about the, this card going forward still. Next, we have Haunted Manor. Haunted Manor is actually not the card that I, I was hoping would get hit from Halalu. I think Haunted Manor is definitely uh, more powerful than Halalu Oathman, but Halalu Oathman is more explosive and leads to more unfun games, I think, whereas uh, Haunted Manor is a little bit simpler to answer, a little bit more manageable, and also a huge temple loss in the mirror, which is a significant thing to, you know, to take into account when you're playing games on the ladder with a Halalu deck. You know, when do I drop this? It created some interesting situations there. But, uh, you know, anything that affects that deck, I think, is reasonable just because it is a super high power level deck and it can high roll like crazy. This isn't going to, I don't think, stop it from high rolling like crazy necessarily. But just like the other balance changes, I think it makes it a little bit worse. F you know, full disclosure, not the card I would have changed from this archetype, from this deck. I think Hal Halalu Oathman is just dangerous. I think anytime you give anybody free Magicka, you're playing with fire. But yeah, Haunted Manor. You know, there's a history of support cards of buff creatures in this game being uh, receiving balance changes, right? We've seen it to... Um, Northwind, Northwind Outpost, I think, the red support that gave, gave red creatures plus one, plus zero. We've seen it to Divine Fervor when it went from four to five cost. Uh, both of those were just, whether they were too powerful or not, their impact on the game was too great at that cost. Uh, both of those cards continue to see play. Um, the, the Outpost sees play at, in tournaments, it's not great on the ladder. It does see, it still see play on the ladder in um, Market Archer decks, which I think have always been a lot better than people give them credit for. But uh, I, I do, I am really excited to see any change to this deck happen. I, I almost think that you could cut Haunted Manor from a Halalu deck once this batch goes live and still see about the same win rate you were seeing before. Haunted Manor is definitely a card that's essential in some of these matchups. But really, it's the overwhelming card advantage that uh, ends up winning most of those games. So, it, and, and that's challenging to change, too, because Halalu just has a critical mass of cards that draw cards, um, which is really why you're able to just so effectively just spam the board with stuff. The Haunted Manor, I, I'm like, so in conclusion, I guess, I'm glad something got changed. I don't know that this affects the deck at all. I think you could just remove Haunted Manor. Um, and be pretty much the same because there are a lot of games you don't draw Haunted Manor and you never think to yourself, oh, if only I'd had Haunted Manor, I would have won. When you draw the Haunted Manor, it, it sort of warps the way you play whether or not that is a more effective Halalu deck than the optimal Halalu list is sort of, you know, I think up in the air and uh, now I think it's probably not. I think it's probably not. So there you go. H expect to still see a ton of Halalu. Uh, next we have the Hand of Dagoth. Hand of Dagoth is not a card that I felt was like overwhelmingly oppressive or anything. It sees a lot less play now than it did in the first couple of months of the Houses of Morrowind meta. But I think that there are two ways to look at this. One is that first, if you remember when this card was seeing a lot more play, it was a lot more mid-rangey of a meta. This card and Telvas Magister, another card which got changed, which we'll get to in just a second, were sort of like kings of mid-range, right? Like, that is where these cards shine. Now, don't get me wrong, Hand of Dagoth can still, if coming down on four or five, be absolutely backbreaking against an aggro deck, 
I don't know this that this change actually changes that all that much. I think what this does is just change the way this card interacts in the mid-range mirrors. Um, I do think that Hand of Dagoth might be slightly too powerful uh, at 5-5 five, five for 5. I'm more concerned that, well, I think that it's possible that this card was appropriately power leveled at 5-5 five, five for 5 in like a sort of like spiritual sense, I guess, if you will. But it's that other decks were doing things at this same power level at different casting costs, but not at, at 5, right? And this card was so good at winning mid-range mirrors that this comes to my second point, which is that it's possible that the expectation after these changes go live is that we're going to see a lot more mid-range for a while, and Hand of Dagoth is going to be a huge player in that. Otherwise, I mean, other cards in Dagoth did get hit. Like I said, Telvas Magister received a nerf. But I think that uh, I think that it's possible this is sort of looking to the future, sort of like when Manticora and Nixox got nerfed in the same patch. Mant Nick the Nixox combo decks originally were doing a great job of pushing out the Manticora decks, and Manticora getting nerfed at the same time resulted in a meta featuring, you know, not really either one for a while. That sort of swung back as dedicated players to so those archetypes have done a lot of work, um, figuring out how to approach those decks in a, in a new environment with different tools. But Hand of Dagoth is just insanely powerful. And we'll continue to see, I think, exactly the same amount of play, which I think is indicative of a reasonable, reasonable change. Don't switch out your hands of Dagoth for something else. All right, let's go on to our next card here. This is Telvas Magister. This is my favorite balance change of all time. All time. Telvas Magister, like Hand of Dagoth, except in some ways more impactful because it's a single color and not three, uh, is a card that wins mid-range mirrors, just crushes them. It's not particularly strong in the guidance aggro, although it can be good if your opponent's trying to finish you off with a one card at a turn reach strategy. Um, but this is, this is such a subtle change, but I think so perfect. Because Charmer and I, and, and I know Dust and I, and Ian Bits and I, and CBH and I, we've all had conversations about what, like, what could be changed about this card and it would still see just as much play. I wouldn't went as far as to say that I would play it at 7 Magicka. I would play it as a 5-1. Charmer said it had to be a 5-2. Five, 5-1, five, he'd probably drop it from lists. Um, but this is just an insanely powerful effect. I mean, it's, I think the life gain card, the functional life gain card with the biggest impact in the game right now. Uh, and it's in blue, which is a little weird, right? But yeah, so the change is it adopts the same text as uh, Corrupted Shade, which says that at the end of your turn, if Telvas Magister has ward, you gain ward, as opposed to the other one which says if it doesn't have ward, it dies. Um, this is perfect. This is absolutely perfect. It's much easier to remove the ward from Telvas Magister than it is to kill it. Uh, just like Hand of Dagoth, this is a card that frequently, uh, uh, you know, the aggressor is going to find themselves having to three for one themselves against in order to re regain, you know, any chance of winning, and that's enough time for an opponent to gain control. Now you really just need to one for zero yourself, basically, to get the ward off of it in order to maximize your opportunities to continue pushing damage to close out games. Uh, again, this is not a change that I think is going to affect how much play Telvas Magister sees, which I think is suggestive of a pretty reasonable change uh, and a card that needed to change. I just love this. I love that it's not just a, a stat up here, a stat down here. I love that they changed the mechanic to fit with something that the card already is interested in doing, which is warding everything, and to use a mechanic that is kind of underutilized, which is other things happening based on what this creature's doing. I think I think it's really fascinating, and I, I'm a huge fan of this change. Let's go to our next card. That is Mud Crab Merchant. Mudcrab Merchant. Mudcrab Merchant is a card that uh, I previewed with Charmer. Um, we said it was the strongest one drop in the game. Kind of took a ladder a while to pick up on that. And ever since it's been all over the Master Series qualifiers, it's also been all over the ladder. Uh, and High Legend players have been picking up on this as well um, in, the, in the last few months. Uh, but this is a card that's just sort of exploded. And the problem with this card, I think, is pretty obvious. It's a neutral card that costs one that you can jam in any deck and probably be better off for it. Uh, I honestly think that's where the power level of this card is at. Look, sometimes you're going to roll two cards that are going to screw you over no matter what happens. 
that sucks. Uh, but it, I think it has to be the amount of play this card has seen in the Masters qualifiers that have really pushed this card to the top of people's attention list for cards that need balance changes. Um, now, this is a really subtle change, too, although it is just a stat change. 1-3 to 1-2. Does this do anything for its playability? Uh, the answer is kind of. It's no longer an auto-include. Like, I think it, it, it could be right at 1-3 to include Mudcar Merchant in almost every single deck you build. I honestly believe that that could be true. At 1-2, it's not. It's not. This is going to limit the number of decks that are interested in Mudcar Merchant, although I think Mudcar Merchant was actually underplayed right now. Um, there, in aggressive decks, having a 1-3 for 1 on turn 1 is huge because it dies to almost nothing that your opponent puts out in front of it and, you know, trades with Wardcrafter, for instance, uh, which is kind of a huge deal. I think that this change is pretty significant, actually, because this card, it, it's the culmination of all the things this card does, the 1-3, the 1 cost, the ability that makes it so good. And because it has so few stats, this is a pretty significant reduction in its power level. It's a 33% reduction in its toughness, um, if I'm doing my math correctly. And, and that's a big deal. That's a really big deal. I don't think this card is nearly as good as it used to be. Its ability is still pretty insane. Still pretty insane ability. Uh, we, you know, Whether or not this ability is good for the game in general is kind of up for debate. I think that a card like this being this popular in tournaments is probably not great. So I'm glad it's receiving a balance change. I, I expect to still see some Mudcrab Merchants moving forward at the Master Series finale, but not nearly as many as we would see if it was a 1-3. At 1-3, it also carries Steel Scimitars exceptionally well, which is pretty relevant in aggressive mirrors or in aggressive decks. So, yeah, this is a pretty big change. Uh, and I think it significantly decreases how playable this card is. Finally, we have our one buff. Just like our Skyrim patch a while, you know, about a year ago, which buffed up Brynjolf, from unplayable to, I, I would say, a pretty staple legendary card in a lot of decks, Duke Venom Dren is getting the 4-4 to 4-5 change. Does this make him playable? I think Brynjolf's stronger. Duke Venom Dren is insanely powerful in some circumstances, right? Like, this is the card... I, actually, Matt Nass asked uh, when I was streaming uh, the preview event for Morrowind what my favorite Houses of Morrowind card was. And I answered Duke Venom Dren because I had had some insane experiences with it. Now, here's the thing. Day one, people weren't auto-killing this thing. And uh, people were playing slower decks. <laughs> In a slower deck, this card's crazy. It did make an appearance last weekend at the Elder Scrolls Legends Master Series Qualifier, which we were excited to see. It didn't really do much, but it made it was in some it was in the deck list of a guy who made top eight, which means it, it had to have, you know, it earned its way there. I think that's fair to say. I personally thought this card should have triggered itself, which would have made it a staple, kind of like Brynjolf. You play it on turn five as a four-four. You draw a zero-cost card from your deck if you have one. I think that the card would be in every Halalu deck, which, as a unique legendary, I don't have a huge problem with. And I think this card is not broken at that power level. I think it's insanely good. Now I just think it's okay. Um, I it will see more play right now. It sees like no play. I don't think this card getting lightning bolted is why it wasn't strong, but. Brynjolf suggests that a, an extra point of toughness on a creature like this can be game-changing. So I expect to see it to see some more play. I'm really disappointed, honestly, that it doesn't draw off of itself, even though it would have dramatically increased the power level of the card. Um, I was okay with that. But I, I'm really glad to see a buff in here. Um, I'm, and especially since I predict that for at least a few weeks we're going to see a lot more mid-range on the, on the ladder, I expect to see quite a bit of Duke Venom Dren, whether it's, you know... Um, it matches, you know, the amount of play it should see, I guess, is kind of a question to be figured out later. But I'm, uh, look, I'm not going to, I'm going to play with this card. But I was playing with the card before. Either way, I'm excited to see a buff. I like it that it's on a, in a card, on a card that uh, is unique, legendary, representative of the house. And bringing this guy up to the power level of the other house representatives is, I, I think, pretty important, so... That's it for our balance changes. Uh, I'm super excited. The best time to play this game... Well, the best time to play this game is when new content comes out.
But the second best time to play this game is when balance changes happen and people try all sorts of crazy new stuff. That's what I'm going to be doing when the patch hits. should be sometime next week, according to the article, which I tried to bring up on my screen, but I can barely operate OBS. Sometimes I can't even turn on my computer. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a wrap. I'll see you guys all on the ladder.